Chapter 26, Israel Hands. The wind, serving us to a desire, now hauled into the west. We could run so much easier from the northeast corner of the island to the mouth of the north inlet. Only as we had no power to anchor and dared not beach her till the tide had flowed a good deal farther, time hung on our hands. The coxswain told me how to lay the ship to. After a good many trials, I succeeded, and we both sat in silence over another meal. Captain, said he at length, with that same uncomfortable smile. Here's my old shipmate O'Brien. Suppose you was to heave him overboard. I ain't particular as a rule, and I don't take no blame for settling his ash. But I don't reckon him ornamental now, to you? I'm not strong enough, and I don't like the job, and there he lies for me, sir. This here's an unlucky ship, this Hispaniola, Jim. He went on, blinking. There's a power of men been killed in this Hispaniola, a sight of poor seamen dead and gone since you and me took the ship to Bristol. I never seen such dirty luck, not I. There was this hero Brian now, he's dead, ain't he? Well, now, I'm no scholar and you're a lad as can read and figure, and to put it straight, do you take it a dead man is dead for good, or do we come alive again? You can kill the body, Mr. Hans, but not the spirit. You must know that already, I replied. O'Brien, there's in another world, and may be watching us. Ah, uh, well, says he. That's unfortunate. Appears as if killing parties was a waste of time. Howsoever, spirits don't reckon for much by what I've seen. I'll chance it with the spirits, Jim. And now you spoke up free, and I'll take it kind if you'd step down into that there cabin and get me a, uh, well, a uh, shiver, boy, timbers. I can't hit the name of it. Well, you just get me a bottle of, uh, wine, Jim. This here brandy's too strong for my head. Now the coxswain's hesitation seemed to be unnatural. And as for the notion of his preferring wine to brandy, I entirely disbelieved it. The whole story was a pretext. He wanted me to leave the deck. So much was plain. But with what purpose I could in no way imagine. His eyes never met mine. They kept wandering to and fro, up and down. Now with a look to the sky, now with a flitting glance upon the dead O'Brien. All the time he kept smiling and putting his tongue out in the most guilty, embarrassed manner so that a child could have told that he was bent on some deception. I was prompt with my answer, however, for I saw where my advantage lay. And that, with a fellow so densely stupid, I could easily conceal my suspicions to the end. Some wine, said I. Far better. We have white or red. Well, I reckon it's about the blessed same to me, shipmate. He replied. So it's strong and plenty of it. What's the odds? All right, all right, all right, I answered. I'll bring your port, Mr. Hans, but I'll have to dig for it. With that... I scuttled down the companion with all the noise I could, slipped off my shoes. Ran quietly along the sparred gallery, mounted the forecastle ladder, and popped my head out over the fore companion. I knew he would not expect to see me there, yet I took every precaution possible, and certainly the worst of my suspicions proved too true. He had risen from his position to his hands and knees, and though his leg obviously hurt him pretty sharply, breathed, for I could hear him stifle the groan, yet it was at a good rattling rate that he trailed himself across the deck. In half a minute he had reached the port scuppers and picked out of a coil of rope a long knife, or rather, a short dirk, discolored to the hilt with blood. He looked upon it for a moment, thrusting forth his underjaw, tried the point upon his hand, and then hastily, concealing it in the bosom of his jacket, trudled back again into his old place against the bulwark. This was all that I required to know. Israel could move about. He was now armed, and if he had been at so much trouble to get rid of me, it was plain that I was meant to be the victim. 
what he would do afterwards, whether he would try to crawl right across the island of the North Inlet to the camp among the swamps, or whether he would fire Long Tom, trusting that his own companions might come first to help him, was, of course, more than I could say. Yet I felt sure that I could trust him in one point, since in that our interest jumped together, and that was in the disposition of the schooner. We both desired to have her stranded safe enough in a sheltered place, and so that, when the time came, she could be got off again, with as little labor and danger as might be. And until that was done, I considered that my life would certainly be spared. While I was thus turning the business over in my mind, I had not been idle with my body. I had stolen back to the cabin, slipped once more into my shoes, and laid my hand at random on a bottle of wine. And now, with this as an excuse, I made my reappearance on the deck. Hands lay as I left him, all fallen together in a bundle, and with his eyes lowered as though he were too weak to bear the light. He looked up, however, at my coming, knocked the neck off the bottle like a man who had done the same thing often, and took a good swig with his favorite toast of, here's luck. And then he lay quiet for a little, and then, pulling out a stick of tobacco, begged me to cut him a quid. Hey, cut me a junk of that. Says he, for I haven't no knife, and hardly enough strength so be as I had. Ah, Jim, Jim, oh, I reckon I've missed days. Cut me a quid, as will likely be my last, for I'm on my long way home, make no mistake. Well, said I, I'll cut you some tobacco, but if I was you and thought myself so badly, I would go to my prayers like a Christian man. Why, said he, now you tell me why. Why, I cried. You were asking me just now about the dead. You've broken your trust. You've lived in sin and lies and blood. There's a man you killed lying at your feet this moment. And you ask me why? For God's mercy, Mr. Hans. That's why. I spoke with a little heat, thinking of the bloody dirk he had hidden in his pocket and designed and his ill thoughts to end me with. He, for his part, took a great draught of wine and spoke with the most unusual solemnity. For thirty years, he said. I've sailed the seas and seen good and bad, better and worse, fair weather and foul, provisions running out, knives a going and what not. Well, now I tell you, I've never seen good come a goodness yet. Him as strikes first is my fancy. Dead men don't bite. Them's my views, amen, so be it. And now you look here, he added, suddenly changing his tone. The tide's made good enough by now. You just take my orders, Captain Hawkins, and we'll sail slap in and be done with it. All told, we had a scarce two miles to run, but the navigation was delicate. The entrance to this northern anchorage was not only narrow and shoal, but lay east and west, so that the schooner must be nicely handled to be got in. I think I was a good prompt subaltern, and I am very sure that Hans was an excellent pilot, for we went about and about and dodged in, shaving the banks, with a certainty and a neatness that were a pleasure to behold. Scarcely had we passed the heads before the land closed around us. The shores of the North Inlet were as thickly wooded as those of the Southern Anchorage, but the space was longer and narrower, and more light, but in truth it was, the estuary of a river. Right before us, the southern end, we saw the wreck of a ship in the last stages of dilapidation. It had been a great vessel of three masts, but had lain so long exposed to the injuries of the weather that it was hung about with great webs of dripping seaweed. And on the deck of it, shore bushes had taken root, and now flourished thick with flowers. It was a sad sight, but it showed us that the anchorage was calm. Now, said Hans, look there. There's a pet bit for a beach to ship in. Fine flat sand, never a cat's paw. Trees all around of it, and flowers are blowing like a garden on that old ship. And once beached, I inquired, how shall we get her off again? Why so? He replied, you take a line ashore there on that other side at low water. Take a turn around one of them big pines. Bring it back, turn around to the capstan, and lie to for the tide. Come high water, all hands take a pull upon the line, and off she comes as sweet as nature. And now, boy, you stand by. We're near that bit now, and she's too much way on her. Starboard a little, so steady. Starboard, larboard a little. Steady, steady. So he issued his commands, which I breathlessly obeyed. 
Till all of a sudden he cried, Now my hearty laugh! And I put the helm hard up, and the Hispaniola swung around rapidly and ran stem on for the low wooded shore. The excitement of these last maneuvers had somewhat interfered with the watch that I had kept, hitherto, sharply enough upon the coxswain. Even then I was still so much interested, waiting for the ship to touch, that I had quite forgot the peril that hung over my head, and stood craning over the starboard bulwarks and watching the ripples spread wide before the bows. I might have fallen without a struggle for my life, had not a sudden disquietude seized me and made me turn my head. Perhaps I had heard a creak or seen his shadow moving with the tail of my eye. Perhaps it was instinct like a cat's, but sure enough, when I looked around, there was Hans, already halfway towards me, with a dirk in his right hand. We must have both cried out when our eyes met, but while mine was the shrill cry of terror, his was a roar of fury like a charging bull's. At the same instant, he threw himself forward, and I leaped sideways towards the bows. As I did so, I let go of the tiller, which sprang sharp to leeward, and I think to save my life, for it struck hands across the chest and stopped him for a moment dead. Before he could recover, I was safe out of the corner where he had me trapped, and with all the deck to dodge about. Just forward of the mainmast, I stopped, drew a pistol from my pocket, took a cool aim, though he had already turned and was once more coming directly after me, and drew the trigger. Oh, Jim, you forgot to draw your powder. The hammer fell, but there was neither flash nor sound. The priming was useless with seawater. I cursed myself for my neglect. Why had I, not long before, reprimed and reloaded my only weapons? then I should not have been, as now, a mere fleeing sheep before this butcher. Wounded as he was, it was wonderful how fast he could move. His grizzled hair tumbled over his face, and his face itself as red as a red ensign. With his haste and fury, I had no time to try my other pistol, nor indeed much inclination, for I was sure it would be useless. Only one thing I saw plainly, I must not simply retreat before him, or he would speedily box me in the bows as a moment since he had so nearly boxed me in the stern. Once it's so caught, and nine or ten inches of blood-stained dirt would be my last experience on this side of eternity. I placed my palms against the mainmast, and was of a goodish bigness, and waited every nerve upon the stretch. Seeing that I meant to dodge, he also paused, and a moment or two passed in feints on his part, and corresponding movements upon mine. It was such a game as I had often played at home, about the rocks of Black Hill Cove, but never before, you may be sure, with such a wildly beating heart as now. Still, as I say, it was a boy's game, and I thought I could hold my own at it against an elderly seaman with a wounded thigh. Indeed, my courage had begun to rise so high that I allowed myself a few darting thoughts on what would be the end of the affair. And while I was certain that I could spin it out for long, I saw no hope of ultimate escape. Well, while things stood thus, suddenly the Hispaniola struck, staggered, grounded for an instant in the sand, and then, swift as a blow, canted over to the port side, till the deck stood at an angle of 45 degrees, and about a puncheon of water splashed into the scupper holes, and lay in a pool between the deck and bulwark. We were both of us capsized in a second, and both of us rolled almost together into the scuppers, the dead red cap with his arms still spread out, tumbling stiffly after us. So near were we indeed that my head came right against the coxswain's foot with a crack that made my teeth rattle. Blow and all, I was the first to foot again, for Hans had got involved with the dead body. The sudden canting of the ship had made the deck no place for running on. I had to find some new way of escape, and that upon the instant, for my foe was almost touching me. Quick as thought, I sprang into the mizzen shrouds, rattled up hand over hand, and did not dare to draw a breath until I was seated on the cross trees. I had been saved by being prompt. The Turk had struck not half a foot below me. So I pursued my upward flight, and there stood Israel Hans with his mouth open and his face upturned to mine, 
a perfect statue of surprise and disappointment. Now that I had a moment to myself, I lost no time in changing the priming of my pistol. And then, having one ready for service, and to make assurance doubly sure, I proceeded to draw the load of the other and recharge it afresh from the beginning. My new employment struck hands all of a heap. He began to see the dice going against him. And after an obvious hesitation, he also hauled himself heavily into the shrouds, and with the dirk in his teeth, began slowly and painfully to mount. It cost him no end of time and groans to haul his wounded leg behind him, and I had quietly finished my arrangements before he was much more than a third of the way up. Then, with a pistol in either hand, I addressed him. One more step, Mr. Hans, and I'll blow your brains out. Dead men don't bite, you know. <laughs> he stopped instantly. I could see by the working of his face that he was trying to think, and the process was so slow and laborious that in my newfound security, I laughed aloud. At last, with a swallow or two, he spoke, his face still wearing the same expression of extreme perplexity. In order to speak, he had to take the dagger from his mouth, but in all else, he remained unmoved. Jim, says he, I reckon we're fouled, you and me, and we'll have to sign articles. I'd have had you for that lurch there. But I don't have no luck, not I. And I reckon I'll have to strike, which comes hard, you see, for a master mariner to a ship's yonker like you, Jim. I was drinking in his words and smiling away, as conceited as a cock upon a wall, when all in a breath, back went his right hand over his shoulder, something sang like an arrow through the air. to blow, and then a sharp pain, and then there I was, pinned by the shoulder to the mast. And the horrid pain and surprise of the moment, I scarce can say it was through my own volition, and I'm sure it was without conscious aim. Both my pistols went off, and both escaped out of my hands. They did not fall alone. With a choked cry, the coxswain loosened his grasp upon the shrouds and plunged headfirst into the water. <laughs> End of chapter 26.